Hey, this is Brad Johnson, senior reporter with The Texan. The second day of the impeachment trial continued with more testimony from Jeff Mateer, the former first assistant attorney general appointed under Paxton, who was one of eight employees to raise allegations of bribery and abuse of office to the FBI in 2020. For this episode, I'm joined by Matt Stringer with The Texan and Patrick Svitek of The Texas Tribune. We'll get into more details of some of these highlights from today. Paxton, who left after the lunch break on the first day of the trial, did not return to the chamber for the proceedings. Attorneys for the House and Paxton began the day with an agreement on which evidence to pre-admit, and Paxton's team said that the suspended attorney general has nothing to hide and would drop their objection to evidence on the grounds of privileged communication. With repeated objections of leading the witnesses from Paxton attorney Tony Busby, House attorney Rusty Hardin questioned Mateer regarding the timeline and reasoning he had when raising the allegations to the FBI. The first name drop of Anthony Fauci, Texans for Lawsuit Reform, and George P. Bush. Mateer said he believed Mr. Paxton was under the influence or being blackmailed because he could not explain why he was working so hard to help Nate Paul, but that Mateer ultimately became convinced it was due to an extramarital affair. During the cross-examination, Busby attempted to draw a distinction between state code and the first article of impeachment regarding the Attorney General's authority to become involved in lawsuits related to charitable organizations, an apparent attempt to throw that article into doubt. Busby accused Mateer and the other whistleblowers for staging a coup against Attorney General Paxton. And after finishing the questioning of Mateer late in the day, the House impeachment team called another former employee, Ryan Banger, to the stand. Hello, everybody. This is Brad Johnson, senior reporter with The Texan. I'm filling in again for our senior editor, Mackenzie DeLulo, on day two of The Texan's impeachment podcast. Today, I'm joined by Matt Stringer, as we were yesterday, of The Texan, but also Patrick Svitek of The Texas Tribune. Patrick, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. So today, we just kind of we picked up where the, uh, the trial left off abruptly on Tuesday. Uh, the, the two parties convened over the evening and settled the dispute that they had over how to admit exhibits and, and what should be admitted. But once they reconvened, they jumped back into testimony from Jeff Mateer, the former first assistant attorney general, uh, who is probably the, the prosecution's, if not the top witness for them, one of the top witnesses. Uh, And that continued almost all day as we sit here. Ryan Bangert, another one of the whistleblowers, just took the stand. But almost the whole day took uh, Jeff Jeff Mateer. So, Matt, let's start with you. Any observations, anything stick out? Kind of got a little fiery during the testimony today, especially in the cross-examination. But uh, from the, the the first part of this with the prosecution finishing its questioning of Mateer, what stuck out to you? Oh man, uh, the whole afternoon was 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 very uh, well. Well, the whole day actually was very lively. Movie quality. Essentially, what we saw was Busby going up, going through methodically trying to pick apart accusations raised in the uh, first several articles of impeachment. Uh, the first article of impeachment essentially. Uh, uh, is raised from the whistleblower complaint. Uh, so Mateer and the other former attorney general um, employees uh, resigned alleging Paxton made uh, inappropriately used the power of his office to benefit Nate Paul. Um, Specifically, in this instance, uh, authorizing the special counsel uh, to 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 look into the particulars and whether or not uh, Paxton specifically had uh, authorized uh, that. Now, uh, <laughs> sorry, what we saw was Mateer testified that they had assumed that Paxton had directly ordered certain actions to the benefit of Nate Paul and went and blew the whistle to the FBI. What Busby forced him to essentially concede today was that he made a reasonable assumption that that had occurred, and he'd asked him uh, whether or not at the time he was aware that the Travis County District Attorney's Office had actually issued a second referral 
that prompted the attorney general's office action uh, without him being aware of it and basically prodded even further and said, well, did you ask Paxton before you went to the FBI or do any further looking? And he essentially said no, uh, that based on the assumptions as it appeared, uh, they felt that there was a uh criminal activity or wrongdoing, either Paxton was being uh, bribed or blackmailed. And so based on what they knew at the time, went to the FBI and, uh, you know, through the cross-examination, Busby essentially started, you know, revealing evidence such as the second referral that that seemed to offer that explanation. Uh, is that's just kind of one of the many, many elements that came out uh, that stood out to me during during the day. Yeah, the, the cross examination got really fiery, and you know, that's kind of Busby's character. He is a fiery guy. Um, you know, he accused Mateer and the other whistleblowers of trying to mount a coup against the attorney general. But before we got to that point, the the prosecution tried to lay its ground lay its groundwork um, with its presumably star witness. Uh, on laying out a timeline of what happened when um, that then Busby then tried to poke holes in Patrick. Uh, looking at the how the prosecution handled its uh, you know its first witness called, what stuck out to you? Any any anything you're taking from that? Yeah, I mean, I think Busby's questioning of. Um, of Mateer really set the tone uh, for the kind of cross-examination we're going to see from Paxton's side. It's going to be aggressive. It's going to be politically charged. Um, you know, it may not necessarily be uh, super cohesive at times, um, but, you know, we saw from opening statements that Paxton's side, uh, you know, is almost casting their defense for an audience outside the Capitol and trying to make the point that this is a, um, you know, political Con- witch hunt. Conspiracy, uh, possibly. What'd you say? Uh, I got the impression that they were trying to to uh, create the impression that there was a conspiracy to oust him, uh, you know, by throwing out the line of questionings regarding the involvement of TLR or uh, his visits to... Uh, Abbott's office, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and kind of, as you said, what, what, what just prompted me to remember those elements was whenever you said, you know, that they were almost speaking to an audience outside of the Capitol, not specifically the jurors in going down that line of questioning. Right. Yeah. I mean, Busby clearly trying to, you know, cast uh, Paxton as the victim of a, a political conspiracy, um, you know, involving um, all these groups and figures that are have been allegedly kind of plotting against him over the years. Um, that's why you saw Busby mention, you know, George P. Bush today, uh, Paxson's former primary challenger. That's why you saw Busby mention Texans for Lawsuit Reform, which went against Paxton in the 2022 primary. And so that was, you know, you know, th- that was striking about Busby's opening statement, but it continued to come through as a strategy today in the questioning of Jeff Mateer. Yeah, and it wasn't just Busby who had kind of a, a clippable moment. Uh, he had multiple, but <laughs> uh, during Mateer's testimony, questioning from the, the prosecution side, from the house manager side, um, he had a line that I'm sure will be repeated often, uh, that the opinion that was allig- allegedly uh, written and forced by the attorney general to prevent foreclosures of Nate Paul's properties back in 2020. Uh, Mateer said during the questioning that it was not written like Ken Paxton, as he knew him. It was written like Anthony Fauci, um, Mm. you know, the proponent of of lockdown policies uh, that especially conservative Republicans uh, really abhor at the moment. And that distinction, I think, is something we'll probably see come up over and over again. Um, But if not, uh, you know, the, the prosecution got got their one big highlight there. Uh, we'll see if they, they continue to hammer that. Um, but going forward, you know, Mateer is probably the top witness, as I said. Maybe that turns out to be something different. But um, how Patrick, how did his demeanor come off on the stand? Did he seem like um, like he's a little nervous or by the end of it, had he composed himself and, and really made his case? You know, I think Mateer was, was, you know, relatively, 
um, composed. Um, he definitely, I think, in the initial questioning um, on Tuesday, came off as a, a little bit nervous. Um, mm-hmm. You know, as we, you know, as we all know, he is one of the whistleblowers who has kept. Um, a pretty low profile in recent years. I mean, he didn't. He was not part of the whistleblower lawsuit. Right. He hasn't been giving media appearances, and so I think in those initial, you know, lines of question that he dealt with, um, he did come off as someone who was maybe a little um, unfamiliar with the public spotlight that has been on some of these other whistleblowers. But I think all things considered, now that we've seen his entire testimony, I think he did come off um, as credible. Uh, earnest um, and competent, um, you know, and someone who is in a tough situation trying to figure out how to do the right thing. Um, but at the same time, I think Busby did raise, you know, was able to raise some questions about just how ethically Mateer and, and his, you know, whistleblower associates conducted themselves, you know, in that in that span of time, um, you know, leading up to reporting to the FBI. Yeah, we saw that really uh, expanding towards the very end of Busby's cross-examination where he started asking them about uh, Mateer's personal attorney, uh, Sutton, I I believe was the name, uh, and asking about how days leading up to the FBI whistleblowing complaint and all that sort of stuff. He'd hired him as his personal attorney. And then at the same time, in his capacity as first assistant attorney general, approved the appropriation of $50,000 to potentially hire him to serve the attorney general's office and was drilling down, you know, saying, wouldn't that be a conflict of interest for, for this attorney? Why would you do that? And then took it a very interesting Another direction in, in saying, I'm trying to figure out uh, why, how you would, uh, let me think of how he phrased it, hire, use taxpayer dollars to hire Sutton as your own attorney or something like that. And I didn't really understand how that worked or what he was accusing him of doing there. Well, the, the argument was that um, Mateer hired Sutton as his own personal attorney. And there's a question about hi- hiring Sutton as counsel for the office. Correct. That's what the $50,000 in taxpayer money uh, is referring to. That never happened, as Mateer said multiple times on the stand. They ultimately decided not to go that route. Uh, but that was something they were considering. And that was something Busby tried to highlight to poke holes in his credibility. Absolutely. And maybe maybe he was expanding it a little generously uh, than beyond what it was. But I guess he was throwing out the possibility of, you know, were you trying to use those taxpayer dollars to hire this attorney to benefit you somehow? Uh, that's kind of the gist of what I, I got there, the direction he was going. Yeah. Well, in, you know, the timeline is something that both sides are trying to establish um, their own twist on it. And there is there's debate about um, you know, there's an email sent that is in the exhibits that Busby highlighted sent at one thirty in the morning allegedly uh, that Harden the manager's counsel came back and said well that's actually not the accurate time because it's universal time and therefore when it would have been actually sent by uh, Jeff Mateer it would have been uh, you know not in the middle of the night and not before. They started, um, they made a decision to go the other way uh, or talk to the FBI. So it, it's really kind of fuzzy at the mm. moment. Um, I don't know if anyone's getting a real clear picture about the timeline listening to this right now. And both sides are trying to, um, you know, especially the, the, the defense is trying to poke holes in what the whistleblowers say occurred when it occurred. Um, Patrick, people watching, you watching, do you have a clear idea of what happened when um, listening to this this testimony? Generally speaking, I do as a as a reporter who's been following this. But there's no doubt that this testimony has been very long and dense at times in terms of going over specific uh, dates, events, actions that were allegedly taken. Um, you know, and you know, I, I guess you have the senators there as a captive audience and they have to right. listen. And so I assume that it's, it's, it's penetrating with them a little bit, but I highly doubt the average person outside the Capitol is, you know, is processing this in the granular detail that it's being, uh, you know, 
communicated in by the by the lawyers. Um, and that's again just I'll go back to what I said earlier. That that's why I think Paxson's team is you know is focusing on just you know, really big picture casting this as a political conspiracy because the, you know, the granular details um, are pretty hard, I think, for the average, uh, you know, Texan to, to understand and, and piece together. Right. And another angle that uh, Busby was trying to paint uh, and he was doing admittedly a pretty thorough job or pretty good job, I guess, was trying to cast Mateer as the maybe jealous bureaucrat. Uh, you know, that bureaucrat word came up several times back and forth between Mateer and and Busby, you know, with him constantly pressing, you know, uh, the fact that, uh, you know, you're the subordinate and, you know, did Attorney General Paxson have this authority and that sort of stuff. And, and you know, Mateer would respond by speaking to the agency structure and process and everything like that. And he would counter back. But, you know, did that authority uh, reside? With um, uh, Paxton, uh, you know, uh, could he make this unilateral decision and all that sort of stuff? Was it illegal, et cetera, et cetera? Um, you know, time and time again from from many different angles. And, and so you kind of had that theme about did this authority did this authority reside with Paxton at the end of the day? And by him circumventing the regular process, is this just him uh cutting the bureaucratic red tape and are are you just a a a uh, uh, angry subordinate uh, sort of picture another effort we saw um from from busby was to try and basically nix the first two articles um you know in the first one it concerns um the role in in the attorney general's office in defending charitable organizations in the state. And uh, he kind of did something similar with the second one, but he highlighted the way the articles were uh, written and then tried to draw a distinction between what state code says. And, you know, if he's successful at that, that would, that would draw out enough, presumably at least his, as he intends uh, no votes on, on those two charges to prevent, you know, a two thirds majority on that. So we can already see the groundwork being laid, um, in, in this strategy, just, you know, again, poking enough holes in witness credibility in the manager's case, the house manager's case against the attorney general. But ultimately we saw just attention kind of drop off from this. You know, obviously we in the press are paying attention, paying attention to this cause that's our job, but there was almost nobody in the, in the Senate gallery, today uh from what i saw um patrick i know you weren't there today but uh th- there it seemed like there was there was a, there were a good amount of people there yesterday and um it, obviously that's not the case today so are we just in for a really long drawn out few weeks of of minutia and uh, eventually this you know maybe the results are just baked in um without having to you know sit through all this yeah, I mean, it clearly attention dropped off today. Um, you know, reports from you know other reporters inside the chamber was that there was not a lot of people filling the public section. Um, I mean, even yesterday, the public section wasn't entirely full. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think to you know to senators especially, it's becoming clear that they are in for a pretty painstaking uh, process in these coming days and yeah. weeks. Um, you know, listening to all these witnesses. Um, you know, having to pause proceedings to hash out procedural disputes. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think attention did drop off today and, um, you know, it's going to continue to drop off. Yeah. And, you know, as we enter the next next few days, um, you know, pr- presumably more whistleblowers will testify. Ryan Banger, as I mentioned, is currently t- testifying. Uh, the same tactics are probably going to be used uh, we'll see to what effect, and Matt. Anything you're going to be watching for as as things go the next few days? Yeah, um, you know, I've 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 seen this tactic that Busby's been using. Uh, we saw it late this afternoon between him and uh, Mateer. Kind of a, it seemed to me kind of like a cat and mouse game where he would ask him, you know, are you aware of this email? Are you aware? Did you send this text? All this sort of stuff, and you'd get a a lot of 
uh, responses from Matir saying, I, I don't recall, or I guess you're going to show me, you know, an email or that sort of stuff. And a lot of the time you didn't see Busby actually say, well, you know, here's the email or here's the, here's the text message. And, and so it, it felt like it was constantly building up to something and then he would move on to another question. So I really wasn't sure if, if he was looking to try and catch Mateer in a lie or uh, if he plans to circle back around with, with evidence. I don't know. What, what was kind of your impression of that, Patrick? Yeah. I mean, I think what Busby was doing beyond what I mentioned about just hitting on the politics, the alleged politics of the situation, um, was just, you know, trying to muddy the waters and sow doubt. And, and look, I mean, I, you know, that, that may sound like, um, you know, a negative comment by me, but the bottom line is that the burden, the burden of proof in this trial is beyond mm-hmm. a reasonable doubt. So he has to just, you know, he doesn't necessarily, you know, he doesn't have to prove, you know, anything a hundred percent, you know, is bulletproof true. He just has to, in the, in the eyes of these jurors, make things look like they're just not fully there, that they're just not fully documented and proven. And so I think Busby did do um, an effective job of that today of muddying the waters and sowing doubt. Yeah, you have like, uh, well, him attacking the specific language of the first two articles of impeachment, where in Article 1, uh, Brad Johnson, uh, you, you tweeted out earlier the exact language uh, where he failed to act as a public protector of charitable organizations as required by Chapter 123 of the Property Code. That's the language under the impeachment charge versus the actual statute of, of 123 of the Property Code that says, yeah, and, and this is what Busby pointed out for and on behalf of the interests of the general public of the state in interest in charitable trust. The attorney general is a proper party and may intervene in a proceeding, essentially arguing he's there. They're there to uh, intervene against the charitable trust to protect the public's interest as opposed to the fine tuned language of, of Article one. Then they did that in art. And then he went to Article two of the impeachment charges, uh, which um, has to deal with his issuance of the uh, 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 infamous opinion letter uh, stopping foreclosure sales, uh, where you have Mateer and the prosecution saying, you know, uh, he issued this opinion. You have Article 2 saying, you know, he misuses official power to issue written legal opinions. And uh, Busby throws down the, the letter in question and says, you know, what does this say on the last page? And and literally made Mateer read it off and says, uh, this is not to be construed as a uh, legal opinion issued under Chapter 402 of the Government Code. Um, so basically impeaching the fine language of both Article 1 and Article 2 of uh, the Articles of Impeachment to sow that doubt mm-hmm. amongst the jurors. Uh, and I, I think he was making doing an effective job as far as I could tell. Yeah. Patrick, last question for you. I want to throw your way. Um Lieutenant Governor Patrick is obviously not a judge. He's he's new at this and having to deal with all these objections, whether to sustain sustain or overrule them, you know, it's it's enough to make your head spin. How do you think he's done overseeing this this whole process in the first two days? Yeah, I definitely give him an incomplete grade. He is still finding his way so far. I think on 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 serving as uh, you know effectively the judge in this proceeding, um, you know, he's having to make. Uh, you know, snap judgments on whether to sustain or overrule uh, objections. Um, he's having to quickly huddle with his team of advisors up there, including his, you know, uh, impeachment counsel, La- uh, Lana Myers, a mm-hmm. former uh, state appeals court judge from North Texas. Uh, so, yeah, I think he is, you know, you're seeing him, um, you know, trying to uh, exude competence uh, and surround himself with the right people, but very much a work in progress. Um, you know, and you're you're already seeing the different lawyers, you know, trying to play to him or kind of rope them into their side of an argument. Um, you saw, I think it was just a few hours ago, but Rusty Hardin, the house lawyer, got up and said, you know, and asked Patrick to really try to um, 
you know, police Busby, the Paxton lawyer, um, for giving little mini speeches while also registering his uh, objections. And Patrick said something to the effect of, well, I've noticed both of you are doing that. So, you know, I'll, 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 <laughs> I'll call it out. But, you know, let's be clear, it's happening on both sides. <laughs> um, so I do think Patrick is still, um, you know, uh, finding, you know, finding his footing in this new legal role. Quasi, yeah, and I should say. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he uh, he is conferring with uh, Justice Myers a lot, but also I you know I've seen him a couple times just respond immediately, ruling either uh, you know overruling the objection or sustaining it. So you know, it seems like he's getting the hang of it a bit, but a long way to go. You know, he hasn't he hasn't been sitting on the bench for for decades <laughs> in preparation for this. Second day on the bench. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, Matt, any final observations on that? Well, um, my my uh, overall kind of, and, and this is just a a very generalized opinion, um, but I, I, I think looking at, we kind of talked about this yesterday on the podcast. The first day seemed to be a lot of victories for the prosecution. You know, getting those votes time and time again to uh, reject the motions to dismiss. Lots of uh, lots of victories there um, today with the cross examination by by Busby. Very very showmanship. You have a lot of things that appeal to people outside the Capitol, um, but you also have a lot of. Uh, Detailed substance, I guess, for lack of a, a, a better way to describe it, you know, of Busby going in and attacking the um, the basis for the impeachment charges and, and raising that doubt uh, that's that's going to be necessary um, to ultimately get an acquittal. So uh, I guess I would I would characterize it to say is so far from what I've seen, and of course they're still going. I can hear the TV in the next room uh, of the proceedings uh, still going on. Uh, but as I've seen it so far, it, it, it felt like to me that things were swinging uh, for the other side today after the cross-examination. So, uh, but ultimately, the only way to really tell is whenever things shake yeah. out. Well, you know, in any trial, it's it's punch, counterpunch, and that will continue to be a thing um, as we get through the witnesses, as we get through the, the various details uh, some in excruciating detail, uh, but there's a lot, to, long way to go, no doubt. Um, so with that, I think we'll, we'll we'll leave it. Patrick, we appreciate you joining us. Uh, good good luck the rest of the way. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much, and good luck to you guys for covering this. Right. We'll see thanks. you in the Capitol. Sounds good. All right, thanks guys, appreciate it. Thanks for joining us, and thanks for listening to day two of the Texans podcast. <laughs>